Which land in recorded history had seen as much blood spilled as the Levant? From the coasts of the Eastern Mediterranean, the hinterlands of Syria, and all the way down to the Sinai, some of the most important battles of history have been fought on this land. Megiddo, Kadesh, the wars of the Israelites and Philistines, Raphia, Yarmouk, the Crusades, the Mongols, and even in World War I, the Second Battle of Megiddo, and many more without a name. But what made this land so important? Who were the people that lived here, and how did they fight their wars in the late Bronze Age and somehow leave a legacy that would stand the test of time? All of those questions will be answered in this new series dedicated to the warfare and political situation of the late Bronze Age Levant. But for now, this is the first part of the story of a land of wine, blood and war. This is a story of the Canaanites. The lands of the Levant were inhabited by many different groups. Even though a large number of them shared a common origin, spoke the same or similar enough language or languages, and worshipped the same gods, the Canaanites never truly had a sense of unity. Of course, they had their own cultural differences, depending on the area, and they were frequently raiding as much as they were trading with each other. To the north, in Syria, lay many Amorite city-states and kingdoms, out of which Ugarit was the strongest. One of the main trade centers of the Bronze Age, once friends to Egypt and then firmly allied with the Hittites. Thanks to Ugarit, we have surviving epics of Canaanite literature such as the Cycle of Baal and also records on the military organization of the kingdom and some city-states. A non-Semitic people, the Hurrians, once the core of the Kingdom of Mitanni, settled in large numbers in Syria. Because of their influence, the Canaanites adopted the Marianu system of chariot warfare as well as military organization to an extent as seen in Ugarit. Further south, along the fertile coastal areas, many important city-states would rise, such as Tyr, Byblos, Sidon and Arwad, known to the Egyptians as Fenhu and the Mycenaean Greeks as Punikio. The Phoenicians, master sailors and expert craftsmen and traders, whose heirs, Carthage, would lay foundations to a powerful mercantile empire, one of the most famous enemies of Rome. Further to the south, we also see a lot of city-states, out of which some of the most important were Megiddo, Jerusalem, Shechem, Hazor and Ashkelon. Many cattle-herding semi-nomadic groups roamed the hills and deserts of Syria, Canaan and Northern Arabia. Sometimes they would be classified as ethnic groups, and other times it was just a general term for nomads. The Alamu was a term for many different peoples which raided as far as Mesopotamia and the Persian Gulf in the east, out of which the Suteans were famous as high-quality mercenaries across the Levant and Mesopotamia. Another subgroup of the Alamu that frequently raided together with the Suteans, the Arameans, would mass migrate during the Bronze Age collapse and form a multitude of small kingdoms afterwards. The Shatsu are attested in many Bronze Age sources as another band of semi-nomads. They would frequently raid the Egyptian-controlled territories in Canaan as far as the Sinai, and one theory assumes that a part of the Shatsu that settled in the hills of Canaan during the late Bronze Age would include some of the early Israelites. North Arabian tribesmen started migrating from the desert into Canaan due to droughts affecting the land and also for a chance to raid, because why not? A lot of mixing between peoples would happen, and we would see small kingdoms of Edom and Moab emerge, as well as the later Ammonites. Another group of nomads, the Abiru, are mentioned in many documents of the era, such as the Amarna letters. They were not an ethnic group. The Abiru referred to outlaws, raiders, and mercenaries that were very active during the late Bronze Age. They were not only of Canaanite origin, Many Hurrians, Mesopotamians, and even Luwians, Indo-European groups from Anatolia could be found in their ranks. If you wanted someone's village to burn, you know who to call. A home to many people. The Levant was of extreme strategical importance. The crossroads of the known world. To the south lies Egypt and the rest of Africa. To the west, easy access to the Mediterranean and lands beyond, be they for trade, conquest or both. To the east, the fertile lands of Mesopotamia and the Persian Gulf. And to the north, the rugged lands of Anatolia. 
It's no wonder that countless wars were fought over the centuries for dominion over such a vital location. Many fortresses would be built, and at their prime, city-states themselves would be pretty much impossible to take by direct assault due to their walls and towers, sieging for many months into starvation was the only option. Not only was it important militarily, it was the trading hub of the Bronze Age, connecting all the way from the Persian Gulf to the central Mediterranean. Cattle farming was extremely important across Canaan, and agriculture thrived on the fertile coast. We have records of high numbers of cattle sent as tribute to Egypt or captured after battles. As an example, Tutmos III captured over 22,000 sheep after Megiddo. The lifeblood of the cities was trade, both domestic and foreign produce. The lands of Canaan were rich with natural resources, one just needed to know where to look. Copper was abundant and Canaanite smiths were said to be one of the finest in the known world. They imported tin from the area around the Black Sea, and if some sources are to be believed, a certain tin island, or at the very least, proxying that trade. Precious stones such as malachite or lapis lazuli were mined, and jewel crafting was so important in the city-states that specific guilds were formed with strict rules and they refused to share the secrets of their profession. Phoenician cedar wood was exported across the Mediterranean, and the Egyptians used Phoenician wood for their ships and chariots, and funnily enough, one of the proposed origins of the Phoenician name comes from the Egyptian fenhu, which would mean shipbuilders or woodworkers. Also, at times, the Egyptians would apply that term to all Canaanites, as seen in the Book of the Dead. Olive oil, honey, wine, all of those were in high demand, as the Phoenicians made the best wine known to man. As stated in official records, Tutmos, the great conqueror of Canaan, looted 1,405 jars from the Canaanites, and Egypt received the tribute of 106 jars from the city of Anugasa, the makers of the best wine in Canaan, and let me tell you, the Egyptians were pretty happy about that. The Canaanites controlled the extremely profitable Arabian spice trade through the Mediterranean, and as we all know, he who controls spice controls the universe. Well, at least in theory. One luxury resource that was extremely valued across the Mediterranean came from a gentle giant, or at least that's what I want you to believe, the Syrian elephant. This subspecies of Indian elephant once inhabited the easternmost parts of Anatolia, Canaan, Syria, and all the way from Mesopotamia to the Persian Gulf. The very same elephants that Pyrrhus would use against Rome, and Hannibal's personal war elephant was of Syrian stock. After centuries of overhunting for their hide, the ivory trade and warfare, they were driven to extinction, a depressing end for such a noble creature. And leaving the most important for last, the color purple, made from the Murex sea snail, this was such an important export of the coastal cities, especially Tyre, that in many languages, Phoenicia as a term was associated with the color. It was highly valued by the nobility, and some city-states would give their highest-ranking Marianu and king's companions purple cloaks. You would think that a strong centralized power would emerge to unify Canaan and potentially form one of the strongest powers of the world, yet the Canaanites would never fully unite their own city-states under the rule of a Canaanite king. But once long ago, they were in a position of power. Starting in the Middle Bronze Age, the people of Canaan would migrate throughout the known world, trading colonies across the Mediterranean would be established, but larger, more impactful land migrations went into Mesopotamia, southern Anatolia, and Egypt. The Egyptians had a long history of trade with the Canaanites, and many of them settled within the Nile Delta. Eventually, as the wave of newcomers increased, these Hekau Hasut, as they were known in Egyptian sources, would end up conquering the Delta and ruling over Lower Egypt. Most historians don't agree with the Egyptian Maneton, who wrote about the conquest essentially over a thousand years later, which describes it as a completely barbaric wave of destruction. Were there battles? Yes, especially during the end of the rule, but it was not a savage conquest. We see a mixture of Egyptian and Canaanite influences in the artifacts of the time, as well as mutual trade between the allied Ixos, Nubians, and the remnants of the Egyptian kingdom centered around Waset which would result in the Egyptians obtaining new cattle, crops, bronze working, weapons and chariots. And horses. 
While the ruling Canaanites adopted some Egyptian customs, they still had their own traditions and worshipped their own gods, which, as you can imagine, wasn't exactly popular amongst the Egyptians. Eventually, after over a century of dominion, the Ixos would be driven out of Egypt by Amos I, who would go on to establish the 18th dynasty and completely change the foreign policy of Egypt. Canaan would be ruled with an iron fist. The Egyptians would send their officials and military garrisons to enforce peace and collect tribute in the lands of Retenu, as they called Canaan. Wheat, gold, horses, composite bows, cedar wood, wine, and even bread from some cities known for their high quality produce were used as tribute. Canaanite nobles would send their sons to Egypt where they would get educated and molded into faithful servants of the pharaoh. But the Egyptians weren't the only great power interested in this land. The kingdom of Mitanni would compete with Egypt which culminated in the, in the Battle of Megiddo. Under Tutmos III, Egypt held dominion as far as Syria. After the downfall of the Mitanni, the Hittites would be the major enemy of Egyptian influence, with the eventual outcome being that the Hatti firmly controlled the north and the Egyptians the south. We have many archaeological sources on the situation in Canaan during the 14th century thanks to the Amarna letters, cuneiform tablets exchanged between the pharaoh Amenophis III and Akhenaten, and some of the other great leaders of the time, as well as the Canaanite subjects. Many letters talk of tribute and display open servitude to the pharaoh, and we get a clear insight into the political situation of Canaan. Out of the 382 Amarna tablets we currently have, around 64 were written by Ribadi, a loyal servant of the pharaoh. He was constantly writing to Akhenaten, complaining about the many problems he faced. The lack of supplies sent to Byblos, constant raids from Amuru by the Abiru under Abdi Ashirta and later his sons. Constant pleas for help, requesting more garrison troops, and the people of Byblos being sold into slavery for supplies as the city was unable to harvest their farms due to the Abiru raids. We even have the first mention of the Shardana, one of the Sea People confederations working as mercenaries. Do not be negligent of your servant. Behold, the war of the Abiru is severe, and as the gods of your land are alive, our sons and daughters as well as ourselves are gone, since they've been sold in the land of Yarmut for provisions to keep us alive. Do not be negligent. Akhenaten was kinda busy trying to completely replace the Egyptian pantheon with his new monotheistic religion, but eventually he was really annoyed at listening to the complaints, so we get this fantastic letter. Why do you alone keep writing to me? Or to put it in modern terms, bro, f off. Unfortunately, blocking someone's message in ancient times was done in a different way. We hear little of Ribadi afterwards, last seen captured and exiled by Abdi Ashirta's son, Aziru, with a high chance of our old friend being executed. Aziru would later betray the pharaoh by making a secret deal with the Hittites, which would transfer Amuru's allegiance with them. As we can see by the letters, the situation in Canaan was quickly turning from bad to worse. In the 13th century BC, many Canaanite cities revolted against Egypt and due to the natural factors such as drought, tribal confederations were forced to migrate towards the more fertile areas of Canaan. The Israelites, Moabites, Shasu, Arameans and other groups would intensify their raids against Egypt in an effort to settle with mixed success. And to make a bad situation even worse, the Sea People confederations would appear in mass looking for plunder and a new home. The Levant was on fire during the late 13th and early 12th century BC. The Kingdom of Ugarit was destroyed by the Sea People, and many cities in Syria and Canaan show signs of destruction either from Egypt as retribution for rebellion, or from a mixture of Sea People and other Canaanite groups that decided to join in on the party. Ramses III managed to stop the Sea People at the Battles of Jai and the Delta, but Egypt was too weak to completely get rid of the Sea People. Some confederations led by the Palisade settled in southern Canaan, where they would become to known as the Philistines. And in the early Iron Age, the Israelites and other Semitic groups that were already documented by the closure of the Bronze Age would have established their own kingdoms and engaged in a series of epic wars. The Phoenicians managed to survive the collapse, and not just survive, but thrive. How? Now that's an interesting story left for another time.
Syria would be divided between the Neo-Hittite states and the Arameans, but that would not last, and the cycle of war would continue. And with this, we end our preview about the importance of Canaan and the political scene towards the end of the Late Bronze Age. What you're gonna see next? Well, you're just gonna have to guess, but let me tell you, it's about to get even more interesting. If you enjoyed the video, I'm really happy about that, and if you didn't, well, I'll send you a strongly worded Amarna letter. As always, I'm really grateful for your support. It's always appreciated. Any like, share, subscribing even if you're crazy enough, I'm just giving it a thumbs up. So, until the next time... <laughs>